We've got uh, several people to talk about here who have passed away, including, of course, Jerry Jarrett, who passed away on Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. I don't really know where to start because I've pretty At much At the beginning. Written, I've pretty much written half a book on him already today in the last two days. But, um, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, sad news. Uh, uh, he was, uh, you know... Uh, legendary promoter in uh, Tennessee and uh, had a, a career, you know, a long, long career in wrestling as far as uh, starting as a child. His mother was a promoter. His mother worked in the office and he was, uh, you know, around wrestling since since he was a, a young child and he was uh, promoting shows as a teenager and setting up the chairs and the whole bit. And then... Uh, went to college and worked for a couple of years and wanted to get back into wrestling and wanted to be a wrestler, which his mom didn't want him to do. And he ended up being a wrestler and was a, you know, a very successful baby face in Memphis for several years while also being a booker and, um, you know, booked for uh, Jim Barnett in the wrestling war in Atlanta in the mid seventies or early seventies. And, uh, you know, um, Memphis was, uh, you know, uh, very, very strong city, one of the strongest weekly cities in the country. And he booked that for years with a lot, a lot of high points. And uh, his booking was probably of all the of all the uh, television shows back in that era, his would be the closest to what I would call modern WWE wrestling, you know, where it was heavily emphasized on the talking was the star of the show, the skits were the star of the show, the wrestling was a, was a secondary thing on the television show. But uh, it was a very, very successful uh, show, ratings-wise, the most successful show in the country. And, uh, you know, until, obviously, you know, 1984, when Vince went national and changed everything. And he still had a couple of good years after that. He had several good years. And then it went down, you know, which it was going to do. He was uh, the last uh, surviving promoter, uh, partially because uh, he, you know, wasn't paying much and also because he was getting his uh he was actually getting paid by the television station because he delivered ratings where most of the other promotions were having to pay for their tv or at worst or at best had barter deals so he was able to last through 97 and and uh you know um sold the company um when he was about to fold it uh, jerry lawler who was his business partner uh offered him two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the company not telling him that he had a million dollar offer uh, so 250000 for his 50%, not telling Jarrett that he had a million-dollar offer for the 100%. So um, Jarrett, I mean, Jerry Lawler then sold the company for a million. And um, Jarrett was out of wrestling. He made several attempts to get back in, um, you know, tried to buy WCW. Um, that failed. And um, started TNA with uh, Bob Ryder and uh, Jeff Jarrett. And uh, they were actually on on, uh, on, a, on a boat, and it was basically Bob Ryder and Jeff Jarrett tried to convince Jerry to get in, and convinced him that the idea is is that television production costs so much, and that was like a big expense. And uh, what we should do is do weekly pay per view shows with no television, and uh, that wasn't going to work. But uh, you know, Jerry, I guess, was convinced that it would work. Uh, years later, I remember talking to him, and I go like, you know, how could you, how could you think that this was going to work? And he said, when you're older and you have a son, uh, you'll understand. So that was kind of what he said, which I sort of did years later. Um, that you know, you'll do anything, even if it's, you know, not the best business move. And I think that. Uh, whether he knew it, I mean, he was trying to sell it. I remember when the thing started, he was trying to sell it like it was viable, like they could do 50,000 buys a week. He was even telling people they could do 500,000 buys a week at whatever it was, like $9 or something like that, which was, even 50,000 was ridiculous. Um, but, you know, they started TNA. He was there for the early years. Him and Jeff had a falling out, and he was out of wrestling again. Um, you know, tried to get on TBS. That, that didn't work out. Um, and, uh, eventually, you know, they did get on, uh, on, um, you know, uh, Spike 
and I think Jerry was Jerry was gone right about that time because Jerry was gone in 2005 and they got on Spike on 2005 and you know he was around for years and wrote a you know wrote a book with Mark James and um, Jerry was an he was a very very smart individual very very business smart um, very booking smart um, I remember asking him like uh, what's the secret you know of good booking just you know and he was oh he would play he would play coy and play I don't say play dumb but sort but kind of downplay a lot just go ah, just do what I think would entertain me and hope that it entertains everybody else and uh, that was his philosophy on booking but he was pretty intricate in it you know he was good at building long-term things not quite Watts level when it came to long-term booking but uh, you know I mean he was uh, he understood his market and what would work and he had uh, a lot of classic people uh, you know Jerry Lawler one of the great um, weekly characters you know as far as being able to draw somebody week after week because of his uh, working ability and more his talking ability and carrying ability where uh, Jared could bring in guys that weren't that good but if they were marketable Lawler could get them through matches that didn't stink out the joint and even could be somewhat good and bring people back week after week year after year after year and he had Lance Russell who was incredible in his role as an announcer and you know him and Lance did not get along and uh, at the end they didn't get along they ended up reconciling later in life but he always knew that he couldn't fire Lance because Lance was the, one of the you know one of the keys to that thing working and uh, their television ratings were ridiculous I mean they were you know the highest rated wrestling show um, anywhere week after week after week um, there was a year where uh, NBC had uh, you know because they were on the NBC affiliate and there was a point where there was a World Series game on Saturday morning when wrestling was on and they would not the NBC station would not air the World Series because wrestling was so popular and at the beginning when Saturday Night's Main Event came on in, in uh, 1985 uh, the NBC affiliate WMC would not air Saturday Night's Main Event for a couple years there until finally they kind of had to back down and air it because they understood that if WWF got you know that kind of television exposure that their own weekly wrestling show would start hurting and they didn't want that because that was like you know the that was the highest rated show on the entire station but you know the inevitability was the inevitability and uh, you know I mean it was just a, a a part of wrestling but that time changed and it was gonna change and um, you know he lasted longer than most he was not someone who was going to lose money promoting wrestling I remember him telling me the story you know although then then again he did with his son um, but that was a different story but at the time he said like I'm not in business to lose money and as soon as you know like these other promoters when the territories were going down um, you know I mean they they lost a lot of money on the way out um, and he was as soon as he started losing money it was like he was ready to shut out you know shut the company down and uh, said I was ready to shut it down and then Lawler comes and offers me a quarter of a million dollars and it's like that's found money and uh, he was uh, very happy to take it and then be out because he knew that the day was over and um, you know always said like it was a great time in his life but that time was over and he knew it wasn't coming back and uh, you know um, and there's a lot else I could say about about him I don't know if you have any questions about him because I mean I used to talk to him you know not not a ton but but often enough you know over the years from mid 80s until uh, I don't know the last time we did a podcast with him was cut which was a couple of years ago I think he was trying to get a, a podcast off the air and we did a show and uh, you know he was uh, excellent guest you know and um, remember when Eddie Marlin passed away who was his father-in-law you know we uh, talked about that and um, you know it wasn't um, you know during the um, I, I mean he was um, he knew everything about that WCW sale you know I mean which is interesting because 
I was talking to people involved in the sale, and I was talking to everyone in, you know, in WCW practically um, at that time when they were uh, in, you know, trying to put when they put the thing up for sale in two thousand and two thousand one, and when they theoretically sold to Bischoff, although it wasn't an official sale, and then leading to the sale with Vince and everything. And we used to, some people in WCW would always joke, it's like, everybody talks to you. And Wade Keller is like, he knows more than anyone. And it's because Wade and Jerry were, were, were friends and um, at the time. And um, Jerry knew, like, Jer Jerry knew, I mean, it's funny, like, he, 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 he seemed to know more about Eric's business than Eric knew at the time, which you know was i mean he he really knew what was going on there in in every aspect of it but he couldn't get it you know i mean he's you know he he wanted that company you know i mean when he started tna i mean the idea was is that there are all these wrestling fans who stopped watching wrestling when wcw died so he wanted to bring back all the old wcw stars and get those fans back but that that did not work i mean that once that line is cut you know it's like very very difficult to impossible to get those people back well so, the line was not only cut but i mean it, it wasn't really an extension of of wcw and you were being asked to pay yeah. and uh i mean there were there were certainly a, a lot of issues yeah. but you know people always always try to find a way to bring back those fans after a promotion dies and it uh it, it never works never happens no they're gone it's like like the attempts to uh Revive the ECW, if you remember. It's like they got, like, you can get you can get a short-term nostalgia boost by doing a nostalgia show, being bringing back the old stars. But um, it, you know, it never sustains in that way. And this nostalgia doesn't sustain. You know, I mean, it's great, like, if you're a rock musician and, and you tour once a year or something, you know, from the past, you can do big, big biz business. But you're not going to be able to, um, you know, get those people week after week after week. You know, not that anyone can now, but um, it's just, you know, I mean, that was, uh, you know, I mean, the idea of, of doing this to get back the WCW fans, um, I mean, it was an idea, but it, it wasn't going to work that way. And, uh, you know, they, you know, he got saved, you know, he got saved because they were, they were on the verge of bankruptcy there when, when they found out. I mean that was another one. They're you know they they were about to close the company. Um, they were swindled by their um, the guy who was handling their pay per view and giving them fake numbers on how many pay per views they were doing. Um, way inflated, so they thought, hey, we're doing okay, and they kept spending money. And then when the checks came in, they found out that they weren't doing well at all, um, which they shouldn't should have known because in the cable industry it was known. But they were, you know, their their guy, Jay Hossman, you know, they always claimed he gave them fake numbers. And by the time they figured it out, they had lost a lot of money. And they were about to close. And their, um, as luck would have it, their publicist was Dixie Carter. And they basically told her, you know, that we're going to have to, you know, close. And Dixie Carter goes, I, I can save it. Dixie Carter had a rich father who bought the company, kept them on. Jeff pretty much ran it. Um, Jerry was there. There were, you know, they had a lot of tension. You know, Jerry had different ideas than, than Jeff. Uh, Jeff was uh, a big proponent of Vince Russo. And Jerry didn't hate Vince Russo at first. And I, I wouldn't even say, he, he, I don't know if he ever hated Vince Russo. But in time, he, he did not feel Vince Russo was a good booker. And I think he was hurt that Jeff chose Vince Russo to be booker above him because... Um, you know, he's this legendary booker and, you know, Vince Russo, uh, was not. And, but, you know, I mean, that was the decision that was made and there were other reasons and he, um, you know, he ended up leaving the company and he had health issues as well at that time. But, um, you know, I mean, he, uh, you know, he, he had a very unique view of wrestling and, you know, it's funny when they say that, uh, I mean, Cornette was actually the one who used to say this. It's like, you know, when, when the people in WWE would go like, well, you know, because Cornette, of course, was always a proponent of the old school was the best way to do it and everything like that. And and, and then in WWE, they'd go, yeah, but we, 
we're not, you know, we draw, we draw a family audience. And the thing is, it's like in Memphis, they were doing, I mean, literally over 20% of the population of that city averaged watching 90 minutes of that show every Saturday morning um, for years and years and years. And he goes, aren't those all family people too? And, you know, they drew week after week after week. I mean, it wasn't always sellouts and it wasn't even always 8,000 people or anything like that, but they were pretty consistent, um, you know, for in, in, in the glory days, you know, where, you know, I would say 4,000 was a bad week. Uh, 5,000, 5,500 was normal. Some years, 7,000 was normal when they were really booming. They'd have a couple sellouts every year, especially in the summer. They were very big summer business. To, you know, he had uh, different guys that could be great attractions. He knew when to bring them in. He knew how to use them. He, you know, he drew big with Roughhouse Fargo, who was a skinny uh, Carolinas referee um, who, you know, I mean, it was one of the best story, you know, effective storyline guys that they had was Sonny Fargo, uh, Roughhouse Fargo would, would come in and, and draw big, you know, about once a year or something when Jackie Fargo would get mad and I'm um, letting Roughhouse out of the institution. The story is, is that he was in a mental institution and maybe two weeks of the year, you know, he would come in, but his actual job was as a referee for Jim Crockett Promotions and um, Jim Crockett Promotions used to take off Christmas. So, um, you know, the weeks before Christmas. So, you know, during that period, you know, Jackie would bring in Roughhouse and they would, Roughhouse would do, you know, his, his bit and, uh, and always, you know, pick up the house. They did, the Fargo brothers did great, great business for years and years and years. And, you know, Jerry, uh, Jerry had the thing with, uh, Nick Goulas. Um, you know, he booked for Nick Goulas and Roy Welch from, you know, he started booking, I think, when he was like 27 years old. And he was booking Atlanta um, for, for Jim Barnett when he was 31 years old. And that's pretty amazing because in those days, you know, they wanted you to have tons and tons of experience. But when um, Barnett was in the wrestling war, so the, um, you know, the Atlanta wrestling war, which was in, starting in uh, Thanksgiving in 72, uh, they brought in Bill Watts to be the booker and, and watched it very well. And then uh, Eddie Graham wanted to bring Bill Watts to book Florida. So Bill Watts went to Florida, and Barnett had taken over Georgia, and he was still in the war. And he, you know, because of the success Jarrett had had in Memphis, Barnett brought, uh, you know, uh, Jerry Jarrett in to book Georgia at a young age. And, um, you know, which was a big vote of confidence. And then when they had... The wrestling war in 77 when basically he felt that Nick Goulas had swindled him. Um, he thought he was buying into the company and then Nick Goulas, he had spent $50,000 saving money to buy into the company. And then Goulas basically said, you didn't buy into the company. And um, so Jarrett started his own company and he was able to get uh, Channel 5 in Memphis, the NBC affiliate. He was able to get Lance Russell. He was able to get Dave Brown. He was able to get Jerry Lawler. And pretty much most of the roster, actually. Rocky Johnson. You know, if you look at the guys um, that were the big draws, the only ones he didn't get were Tojo Yamamoto, who was his best friend, and Jackie Fargo, who he was his first big draw when he was booking. Those were the two guys who stayed with Goulas, probably figuring that, you know, Goulas was, had been running the place forever, and he was going to... Uh, always run the place and in and in most cases in the wrestling war the incumbent does win but this was a this was a wrestling war that was very short-lived um you know it was one side was drawn uh, you know i mean they because lawler you know was the key but because he because jared got most of the top guys and uh, you know one of the keys was that at this point in time, Barnett was booking the NWA world champion, Harley Race. And, you know, Goulas figured that the, you know, the NWA is going to help him against this outlaw promotion because Goulas had been the NWA member. And Jarrett, you know, was friends with Eddie Graham and friends with those people. He'd gone to those meetings. And Goulas was not well liked at all. You know, he was very, you know, a lot of people considered him kind of an embarrassment to the business in a lot of ways. And so they were, you know, they did not stick up for Nick Goulas, and um, 
you know, I mean, Harley Race worked for Jerry Jarrett, um, you know, against Rocky Johnson, you know, right when that wrestling war was going. Um, in the middle of that very short wrestling war, he, you know, the NWA sent their world champion to work for Jerry Jarrett. So, um, you know, that aspect um, was very different from a usual wrestling war with an outlaw promotion or a startup against the NWA. And um, he, uh, you know, Goulas, Goulas was out of Memphis real quick, and Jerry had it, and uh, Memphis became, you know, it was had been and, and remained the top city in that uh, in that um, territory. And eventually Nick went out of business in Nashville and the other places using his son as the top star, and Jerry took those places over and had the big territory that, you know, thrived until... Um, I mean, they still were strong. I would say they were still strong through 86, 87, even into 88. There were some good houses. From that point on, it was profitable, but it was a, you know, it was certainly not what it was. As, as were, you know, all the territories were dying. You know, you couldn't compete with Vince. You couldn't compete with Crockett. They had all the stars. And their, you know, their TV was on in the market. You know, I mean, it wasn't like you were the only TV in the market. And your guys were the only wrestlers the fans knew. And so, uh, you know, I mean, that was just the the nature of how the thing, you know. I mean, it, that was that way for everyone. Jerry, Jerry held on better than most. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the stuff in the 90s, I wouldn't say. Like, if you watch those, some of those 90s shows, the TV, it wasn't really all that great. But, um 70s and 80s, um, I'd say late, you know, I mean, um, 70s and 80s with the promos, and they had all those good promo guys, and um, they had some of the best TV that you would see for that era. It was really, I, I think, the most entertaining, and a lot of people would knock it because they would say it would only work in Memphis. But I know when I would watch it, I found it more entertaining than, you know, I mean, most of the TVs. Um, you know, Watts's was Watts's was better because when when it came to solid wrestling, obviously, but but Jarrett's was just an entertaining show. The great announcing, um, you know, Lance Russell and Dave Brown had so much credibility as announcers that they could sell the wacky gimmicks. And I know, like Jarrett used to say, I mean, it's like that the most, you know, I mean, again, not a friend of Lance Russell during this period at all, but great respect for him and he would say that like you know that lance was the key i remember when he he told mike tenay when when he started in tna he said like just remember like the credibility of the announcer is uh the most you know the announcer has to have credibility with his public and he said like when when we would tell lance russell that if you uh if you're going to come to one show a, this year come monday night we knew we were going to get a full house or close to it because we only asked him to say it one time a year and we only asked him to say it when we thought it was the biggest show of the year. You know, rather than like these other places that would do it every week to where, you know, whatever the announcer said, it didn't, you know, people didn't believe him. So, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was that. But uh, smart guy, very, very smart guy. Poor Steffi. Every time she comes out, she gets poor Steffi. All right. Yeah. Any anyway, she, her and her dad were in the in the ring, and he was oh, going to give gonna her. It's going to be quite a review a, tonight. He was going to give her a trophy for something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the good old days. And then uh, Shane tells his dad he wants to run Monday Night Raw. <laughs> this is insane. Meanwhile, right. there's gigantic news in the world of wrestling that we're not talking about because we got to talk about a Raw from 25 years ago. Yes, Granny. Can I stay long enough to hear what the news is? I know what it is. Well, we don't know what the news is officially, Granny, so just tune in tomorrow. No. <laughs> what a crummy show. Oh. Wow! Oh. What do you want me to do about it? What the? <laughs> if you enjoy these videos, for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full-length editions of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, The Mad Men Podcast, Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo and more, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.